Last class, we were focusing on making good premises. If we were making good analogies, we tried to make analogies that didn't have relevant disanalogies. If we were making good conditional analyses, we were trying to make analyses that didn't have counterexamples to them. This class, we're going to focus not on making good premises, but we'll focus on making strong inferences. And we'll especially focus on deductive arguments. So arguments come in two different forms, deductive and inductive forms. For inductive arguments, their characteristic is that the truth of their premises only makes the conclusion more likely. Whereas deductive arguments, the truth of their premises means the conclusion is true. In inductive arguments, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is more likely than it would have been. But in deductive arguments, the truth of the premises ensures that the conclusion is true. So some examples of inductive arguments. All the swans I've ever seen are white. Therefore, all swans are white. So here, you've seen many, many swans in your life, and every single one of them was white. And so you conclude, hmm, it's probably the case that all swans are white. That it's not just that it's happened to be that way, but that it's a general rule that all of them are white. Here, the premise doesn't make the conclusion certain. It might be that some swans are not white. They might be orange or black. It's just I haven't seen any. All this premise does is make the conclusion more likely than it would have been if I didn't have this premise. So it makes it more likely. Another example is this one that we saw last class. Cars should go in for regular checkups. People are like cars. Therefore, people should go in for regular checkups. This is an argument from analogy. There's an analogy. People are like cars. Since cars are like this, so people are like this. Again, the premises don't make it absolutely certain that the conclusion is true. People might not actually need to go in for regular checkups, but if the premises are true, that makes it more likely the conclusion is true. Consider, on the other hand, this example of a deductive argument. Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. Therefore, Socrates is immortal. In this argument, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must also be true. There's no way for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true. Whereas in inductive arguments, the conclusions could be false even if the premises are true. So in this way, you might say inductive arguments are weaker because they don't ensure that the conclusion is true, whereas deductive arguments are stronger in that they ensure the conclusion is true. But also in a way, inductive arguments are more interesting because they provide conclusions that go beyond the premises. That is to say, the conclusions say more than the premises say. Whereas in deductive arguments, they're less interesting because the conclusion only says what's already in the premises. The argument is only a way of showing what's already in the premises. Right? So this premise doesn't contain the idea that all swans are white. It only contains the idea that some swans are white. The ones that I have seen are white. But it makes the stronger conclusion that all swans are white. But in this one, this conclusion only tells you what's already contained in the premises. So that means deductive arguments are in a way less interesting, but they give you more searching conclusions. Inductive arguments are more interesting, but the conclusions they give you are less certain. And now let's talk about validity and soundness. An argument is valid if and only if 
Necessarily, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true. Necessarily, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true. If this holds true of an argument, then that argument is valid. And if an argument is valid, then this holds true of that argument. And an argument is sound if and only if the argument is valid, meaning it has this property, and the premises are true. So being valid and true is sufficient for being sound. Being sound is sufficient for being valid and true. So let's take some examples. So in this argument, premise one says, if Donald Trump is the US president, then Donald Trump has green hair. Donald Trump is the US president. Therefore, Donald Trump has green hair. This argument is valid because if these premises are true, then the conclusion is true. And that's necessarily the case. It's necessarily the case that if these premises are true, then the conclusion is true. But obviously, the premises aren't true. This premise is false. It's not the case that if Donald Trump is the US president, then he has green hair. No, he doesn't have to have green hair just because he's the US president. In fact, he doesn't have green hair, and he is the US president. So it has a false premise. Nevertheless, it's still valid, because if it were true, and this were true, then this conclusion would also be true. So that's why it's valid. But it's not sound because it has this false premise. Let's take another example. Xi Jinping is the president of China. Conclusion, therefore Donald Trump is the president of the US. In this argument, the premise is true and the conclusion is true. Xi Jinping is the president of China and Donald Trump is the president of the US. But it's not a valid argument. It's not valid because it's not necessarily the case that if this premise is true, then this conclusion is also true. Even though this premise and this conclusion are true right now, it's not necessarily the case that if this is true, then this is true. In fact, it was the case that Xi Jinping was the president of China and Donald Trump was not the president of the US. So it's not necessarily the case that if the premise is true, then the conclusion is true. So let's do an exercise. First, fill in the blanks to make an argument that is valid but not sound. Premise one will say, the moon is not made of tofu. Then here you fill in the blanks. If blank, then blank. Conclusion, therefore blank. So fill in those blanks to make an argument that is valid but not sound. Second, fill in the blanks to make an argument that has true premises and a true conclusion, but is not valid. So again, we'll use the same argument structure. The moon is not made of tofu. If blank, then blank. Therefore, blank. And then finally, we have this question. Are arguments by analogy, that is arguments of the form A is F, A is like B, therefore B is F, valid, sound, or neither valid nor sound? Explain your answer. So what this is saying is, are arguments by analogy valid, sound, or neither valid nor sound? So you might not know what this structure means, but take an example. The sky is blue. The sky is like air. Therefore, air is blue. That's what these sorts of letters symbolization means. Okay, so are arguments by analogy valid sound or neither valid nor sound? And then explain your answer. We've already seen that deductive arguments are valid. That means it's necessarily the case that if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true. But there could be different reasons why an argument is valid. For some inferences are valid only because of the meaning of the premises and conclusion. 
For example, in this argument, the first premise says the shape is a square. So you have a shape in front of you, and it's a square. Conclusion, therefore, the shape has four corners. In this argument, the conclusion has to be true if the premise is true, because that's sort of just what it means to be a square. It means that it has four corners, or that the meaning of being a square implies that the object has four corners. But other inferences are valid because of their logical form, not because of their meaning, but because of their logical form. So we saw this argument before. If Donald Trump is the US president, then Donald Trump has green hair. Premise two, Donald Trump is the US president. Conclusion, therefore Donald Trump has green hair. So in this argument, it's valid not really because of the meaning of US president, green hair. It's valid because of its form. And the logical form of it can be symbolized this way. So here we have the antecedent and the consequent. So that premise can be put like this. If P, where P is standing for the antecedent, then Q, where Q is standing for the consequent. And then premise two is just that. We put it as P. In conclusion, therefore Donald Trump has green hair, but that is therefore Q. So since these two have the same meaning, we make sure that they're represented both by Q. And since these two have the same meaning, we represent them both by using P. So this is the logical form of this argument. And any argument has th that has this logical form is a valid one. We don't need to know the meaning of the antecedent or the conclusion or the meaning of this premise or this conclusion. We don't need to know those meanings. We can just replace those meanings by P's and Q's and we can still know that the logical form is a valid one. That if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true. In this argument, on the other hand, it's not like that. If we represent this premise as P and this conclusion as Q, we don't get a logical form that is valid. We can't see just from this logical form that if the premise is true, then the conclusion is true. No, we can only know it's valid by first knowing what P says. We have to know that P means the shape is a square, and we have to know that Q means the shape has four corners. So here we have to know the meaning to know that it's valid, but here we don't need to know the meaning of these claims. We just need to see its logical form, and then we can see that it's valid. So that argument that we just saw was formulated as premise one, if P then Q, P therefore Q. In this argument, there are variables. So P, Q, you can also use R as variable, S, T, U, V. These are very common variables to use. These are known as propositional variables. That means that they are variables that are replaced by propositions. Meaning you put an entire proposition for P, you put an entire proposition for Q. What is a proposition, you might ask? Well, I'll give you some examples. Here's is fun. Is fun is a predicate. It is not a proposition because it doesn't make a statement or claim. That is, if you just say, is fun, you're not saying something that is true or false. You're not making a complete claim. So it's not a proposition. It's just called a predicate. Now consider dog. This is a noun, but it's not a proposition because it also doesn't make a statement or claim. If you say dog, you haven't said something that could be true or false. You've just said dog. Now consider this. Dogs are fun. This is a proposition because it makes a statement or a claim. It's saying something that could be true or false. So for if P then Q, you cannot put is fun there. You can't say if is fun or you can't say then is fun. You cannot say if dog, 
You cannot say then dog. You can say if dogs are fun, or you can say then dogs are fun, right? You can put complete propositions here. These stand for complete propositions. You also have logical connectives. So in this argument, the logical connective is if then, if then. And this logical connective is often symbolized using an arrow, like this, P arrow Q, which just stands for if P, then Q. I won't be using symbols like this in this lesson, but if you do see this sort of arrow in a paper, you'll know what it means. It means if the antecedent, then the consequent. You might be wondering what the difference is between propositions and sentences. We've been looking at dogs are fun. I've said you can put propositions in propositional variables, and this is a proposition. But isn't this also a sentence? Is, is sentence and proposition the same thing? Well, here's the difference between proposition and sentence. Here's one sentence, dogs are fun. Here's another sentence, go hen yo chu. And hopefully I'm right that these two mean the same thing. If not, you can let me know. So these are different sentences, right? They, they're written differently. They use different letters, different characters, right? These are different sentences, but they express the same proposition. They mean the same thing, at least if my translation is correct. So by talking about propositions, philosophers are trying to point more specifically to what these things mean. They're not pointing to how they're written, and they're written very differently. They're pointing to what they mean. So when they're talking about propositions, they say the meanings is what's important. That's why they prefer to talk about propositions rather than sentences. We can also make this sort of same distinction between individual words. So the word dog and the word go, they're different words, right? They're written differently but they express the same concept. So what these two things express is the same, even though the words themselves are different. Likewise, the things that these two express are the same, even though these two are written differently. So let's turn to some actual logically valid inference forms. The first one is called modus ponens. This is not an English term, it's a Latin term. And so the form of modus ponens is just this, if P then Q, P therefore Q. That's the form we've already been looking at. It's called modus ponens. So for example, if spot is a dog, then spot is an animal. Premise 2, spot is a dog, therefore spot is an animal. There's a fallacy associated with this argument form. It's called the fallacy of affirming the consequent. So a fallacy just means like a mistake. It's something you should not do, but sometimes people do it. So if P, then Q, Q, therefore P. So this is fallacious reasoning. Do not argue like this. This is not a valid argument form. So. This is the sort of way you should argue. Do not argue like this. An example of this fallacious reasoning is premise one, if spot is dog, then spot is an animal. Premise two, spot is an animal. Conclusion, therefore spot is a dog. And we can see that this is fallacious reasoning because we can give a counterexample. A counterexample would be spot being a cat. If spot were a cat, then this conclusion would be false, but the premises would be true. It would still be true that spot is an animal, and it would still be true that if spot is a dog, then spot is an animal. Since this argument form has counterexamples, we know it's fallacious reasoning. It's not valid. But modus ponens does not have counterexamples to it. Another logically valid inference form is called modus tollens. Again, this is not English. It's from a language called Latin. It says, if P, then Q. 
not Q, therefore not P. So it has the same first part as modus ponens, but the second part is different. It denies the consequent and therefore concludes that we should deny the antecedent. Right? It says the consequent is false, therefore the antecedent is false. Whereas modus ponens goes the other way. The antecedent is true, therefore the consequent is true. So an example of modus tollens is this. If spot is a dog, then spot is an animal. Premise two, spot is not an animal. Therefore, spot is not a dog. See, it denies the consequent and concludes that we should deny the antecedent. There's a fallacy associated with modus tollens called the fallacy of denying the antecedent. The form of this fallacy is if P then Q, not P, therefore not Q. Again, this is a fallacy, it's fallacious. Do not do this, it's a mistake. An example of this fallacy would be if spot is a dog, then spot is an animal. Spot is not a dog, therefore spot is not an animal. We know this is fallacious reasoning because we can give a counterexample to it. Suppose that spot is a cat. In that case, the conclusion would be false. Spot would be an animal because being a cat implies that you're an animal. But if spot is a cat, the premises would still be true because spot would not be a dog and if spot is a dog, then spot is an animal. So if spot is a cat, the premises would be true and the conclusion would be false. So that counterexample shows that this is not a valid form of argument. It shows that this is fallacious reasoning. By the way, this is called the fallacy of denying the antecedent because it, it says that the antecedent is false. It denies the antecedent. This is called the fallacy of affirming the consequent because it affirms the consequent. It says the consequent is true. So we've seen modus tollens reasoning, an example of it. But now consider this argument. If spot is a dog, then spot is not a cat. Premise two, spot is a cat. Conclusion, therefore spot is not a dog. How would we formulate this sort of argument using propositional variables? Well, it would look like this. If P, then not Q where P stands for spot is a dog, and Q stands for spot is a cat. So saying not Q means spot is not a cat. And then if Q stands for spot is a cat, then we need premise two to also be Q. And then conclusion, since spot is a dog stands for P, and this is denying that spot is a dog, the conclusion will be formulated as therefore not P. Now the question is, is this modus tollens reasoning? Is it the same? Look, the form is different. It has a not Q here, and this one has a Q. And this one has a Q here, and this has a not Q here. So the form is different. Was it still considered modus tollens? Well, the answer is that it's equivalent to modus tollens. So we can we can still call it modus tollens. It's equivalent to it because of this principle of double negation and the equivalence of double negation. And the equivalence is this, not not P if and only if P. So not not P means this not denies that not P and this not denies that P. So if you deny the denial of P, that's the same as saying that P is true. So since this is equivalent to this, meaning that they are the same, we can just change Q and premise 2 to add some nots to them, right? We go like this, not not Q. That means the same thing as Q. We also change premise 2 to say it's not the case that spot is not a cat. So that's what this not not Q means here. It's not the case that spot is not a cat. This is the first not, 
and this over here is the second knot. But we can see that this argument form is equivalent to this argument form. So Modus Tollen says that the consequent is false. Not Q means that this consequent is false. And so we conclude that the antecedent is false here. And that's the same as this argument. Here we say that this consequent is false. The consequent says not Q. And here we're saying, no, it, that's false. It's not the case that not Q. And so we conclude that the antecedent is also false, not P. So these are equivalent. And since these are equivalent, that means that the original form is also equivalent. If we take out the not not Q, just leave it with Q, that's the same thing. If we take out, it's not the case that spot is not a cat, and replace it with spot is a cat, that means the same thing. So these are the same thing, given the double negation equivalence here. They're both valid forms of reasoning. I should warn you that there are some philosophical contexts, some fields that deny this. They do not think these are equivalent, such as when you're talking about vagueness. But most philosophical contexts allow this to be true. So usually you can assume this double negation equivalence. But I just want you to be careful because in some special contexts you cannot assume it. But generally you can. Now let's look at a popular form of argumentation called reductio ad absurdum. Again, this is not English. This is taken from Latin. And in English, it means reduction to absurdity. Last class, we were talking about absurd. I think that your argument or that premise is absurd. Well, in this argument, you're trying to argue that something is absurd. You're reducing it to something that's absurd. So this sort of argument takes this sort of structure. First, you aim to prove some proposition P. Then you assume for reductio, not P. You deny what you're trying to prove. And then you argue that from this assumption, the assumption that not P, you get Q, some other proposition. And then you say, or argue, well, Q is false, not Q. So you therefore conclude P, which is what you're trying to prove at the beginning. So here's an example. The earth is round. So you're trying to prove P. The earth is round. Assume for reductio that it is not round. So not P. It's not the case that the earth is round or that it's flat. In this case, people would fall off the edge. That is, fall off the edge of the earth. So fall, people would fall off the edge of the earth is Q. But people don't fall off the edge, so that's not Q. Therefore, the Earth is round. So that's what we were trying to prove at the beginning. The Earth is round, and we get there. So notice that reductio ad absurdums, this sort of argument, is a form of modus tollens reasoning. This is because it just says, if not P, then Q, right? You're assuming not P for the reductio, so that's if not P, then you get Q. And second premise, not Q. So therefore, P. You get P because you're denying Q, and that gives you the denial of P. The denial of P is not not P. And as we already saw, not not P is the same as P. So we get P here. So in this example, it's like this. If the earth is not round, then people would fall off. People don't fall off. Therefore, the earth is round. So it's time to do an exercise. Consider these two propositions. Martha is helping, and Martha is making money. Here we can just formulate Martha is helping as P, Martha is making money as Q. Now, what you're supposed to be doing is looking at 
argument form. So the first argument form is this. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. So the instruction is for each of the below argument forms, first write a grammatically well-formed argument that replaces the propositional variables P and Q with the above two propositions. So right now this argument is using propositional variables. I want you to change the argument so that it's using English sentences instead. So replace these variables with these propositions, these claims, okay? And keep the same logical structure. So once you've done that, then go to the second part which says determine which of the logically valid inference forms or fallacies it conforms with. So determine is this a logically valid inference form? If yes, say which one it is. What is it called? Or is it a fallacy? If it is a fallacy, then tell me which fallacy it is. And then do the same two steps for each of the other arguments. B, C, D, and E. Okay, so far we've looked at two logically valid inference forms, modus ponens and modus tollens, and now we'll look at even more logically valid inference forms. We'll look at three more specifically. So the first one is the hypothetical syllogism. This goes if P then Q, if Q then R, therefore if P then R. An example of this would be premise one, if spot is a poodle, then spot is a dog. Premise two, if spot is a dog, then spot is an animal. Conclusion, therefore, if spot is a poodle, then spot is an animal. This is called a hypothetical syllogism because it doesn't actually tell you whether spot is a poodle or whether spot is an animal. It's merely saying if spot is a poodle, then spot is an animal. This is just hypothetical, which means it's not necessarily how it actually is, but this is what would be the case if this is true. It also has this word syllogism, which is a Greek term, not English term, which basically means a sort of argument. The next logical form is called disjunctive syllogism. Either P or Q. Not P, therefore Q. Right, so here it gives you two options, P or Q. It says one of the options is not really an option, it's false. So since this is the only thing left, it must be this, right? An example is either spot is a cat or spot is a dog. Premise two, spot is not a cat, therefore spot is a dog. Spot is one of these, a cat or a dog, and since spot's not a cat, it must be the only option left, a dog. This is called a disjunctive syllogism. Again, syllogism just means argument. Disjunctive refers to this or. So in a claim either P or Q, the or is called a disjunction. And P and Q here are called the disjuncts. So we say that this sentence has a disjunction, or this is a disjunctive sentence, disjunctive. And we can also say this sentence has two disjuncts, P and Q, as its disjuncts. Sometimes disjunctions will have more disjuncts, either P or Q or R. Here it has two disjunctions and three disjuncts. So we'll say this sentence has three disjuncts, whereas this one only has two disjuncts. And then the last one we'll look at for now is called a dilemma. Either P or Q. If P, then R. If Q, then S. Therefore, either R or S. So we started off with P or Q. P 
P led us to R, Q led us to S. So we then know that R or S are options. Since these one of these had to be true, and these imply these ones respectively, we know that one of these has to be true. Traditionally, the word dilemma has a very negative feeling to it. In normal English, it basically just means a problem. You have a problem or a, or a difficulty. So dilemmas are usually showing you something pretty negative. So I'll give you a negative example. Premise one, either you make friends or you don't make friends. Premise two, if you make friends, you will get in lots of fights, right? You're, you're going to fight with your friends. Premise three, if you don't make friends, you will be lonely. You'll be lonely because you don't have any friends to be with. Conclusion, therefore, either you will get in lots of fights or you will be lonely. So the idea is, no matter what you do, you're going to get into problems. Life is not going to be as good as you want it to be. Another way you could have written this argument is either you make friends or you don't make friends. If you do make friends, you won't be happy. If you don't make friends, you won't be happy. Therefore, you won't be happy. That would still be a dilemma form because you won't be happy is plugged in for R and for S. You can have one sentence be used in two different propositional variables. That's fine. You can do that. What you cannot do is have two different propositions go in the same propositional variable. You cannot have this be one proposition and this be a different proposition. That you cannot do. But you can have one proposition go in for two different propositional variables. I should mention that dilemmas don't have to be negative things. They can be positive things. For example, you might have an argument, either you can marry Jim or you can marry Tom. If you marry Jim, then you'll be happy. If you marry Tom, then you'll be rich. Therefore, either you'll be rich or happy. So it doesn't have to be negative things. It can be positive things. It's just traditionally the word dilemma refers to something negative. Also, the word dilemma has this di right here. And that's referring to two. Because we have two disjuncts here. We have two options. A different argument form is called a trilemma. T-R-I. Trilemma. And tri refers to three. In a trilemma, you'll have three disjuncts, P or Q or R. And then you could have quadrilemma, which has four disjuncts, and so on. So here's a summary of the logical forms we've seen so far. Modus ponens, if P, then Q, P, therefore Q. Modus tollens, if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. Hypothetical syllogism, if P, then Q, if Q, then R, therefore, if P, then R. Disjunctive syllogism, either P or Q, not P, therefore, Q. Dilemma, either P or Q, if P, then R, if Q, then S, therefore, either R or S. We've also seen a bunch of logical connectives. These arguments use these connectives. One is the conditional, if then, right? Modus ponens uses if then, modus tollens uses if then. Some arguments use disjunction, or. Disjunctive syllogism has the or, dilemma has the or. And also negation, not. Modus tollens has not, and disjunctive syllogism does as well. So it's time for an exercise. For each of the following, I'm going to give you a bunch of quotes. So for each of the following quotes, give its logical form using propositional variables and logical connectives. Then state whether it follows one of the five logically valid inference patterns just seen. If so, state which one. So here are the quotes that you'll look at. I'm not going to read them all. Just note that this is not standing for a premise. This is quote one, this is quote two, this is quote three. So put this quote 
into logical form using propositional variables and logical connectives. Then state whether the argument that you formulated follows one of the five logically valid inference patterns. And if it does, then state which one it does. Okay? And do that for each one of these quotes. Okay, we've already looked at five logically valid inference forms. Let's look at even more logically valid inference forms. Here we'll look at four more forms, beginning with conjunction negation. Not P, therefore not P and Q. This is called conjunction negation because it has a conjunction here in the conclusion. And this conjunction has two conjuncts. One, two. Just like a disjunction has disjuncts, so a conjunction has conjuncts. And this is called conjunction negation because it's negating, has the word not, this conjunction. So if you know that P is false, you can know that the conjunction of P and some other claim is false as well. So for example, premise one, spot is not a dog. Conclusion, therefore, it's not the case that spot is a dog and that spot is brown. Now we should make a very important clarification here about what this actually says, what the conclusion says. So what it says is you're negating a conjunction. So you say it's not the case that spot is a dog and that spot is brown. So it's not the case that both of these are true. It's not the case that both P and Q are true. This leaves it open that P is still true or it could still be that Q is true. But we know that they're not both true at the same time. Compare that with this claim, not P and Q. It, this also has a not like this and an and like this, but the emphasis is different and the meaning is different. Here we might express this one in English as spot is not a dog and spot is brown. In this one, it's definitely telling us spot is not a dog and it's definitely telling us spot is brown. This one is not definitely telling us either of those things. It's just telling us that at least one of those is not the case. Either spot is not a dog or spot is not brown. One of those is false. They're not both true. But this one's telling us this is false and this one is true. So they're very different meanings. And this argument does not tell you this. It does not tell you that Q is true. This argument does not tell you that spot is brown. Rather, it's telling you that they're not both true at the same time. So it's not true that Spot is a dog and he's brown at the same time. We also have this phrase, we say that this is a negation with an embedded conjunction. This sentence is a negation, and inside the negation is a conjunction. Whereas this one is a conjunction, with an embedded negation. The negation is inside of the conjunction. We also have conjunction introduction. P, Q, therefore P and Q. This one's fairly simple and straightforward. For example, spot is a dog, spot is brown, therefore spot is a dog and spot is brown. Simple enough. And now we get to arguments concerning disjunctions disjunction negation, not P, not Q. Therefore, it's not the case that P or Q. So for example, premise one, spot is not a dog. Premise two, spot is not brown. Therefore, it's neither the case that spot is a dog, nor that spot is brown. Here it's again important to understand what the conclusion is saying. It's saying not P or Q, where the not is outside of these two brackets. So what that says is it's neither the case that spot is a dog nor that spot is brown. But a very similar thing is not P or Q. It both, this also has not and it has or, like the original one, but the bracket is different. This one in English could be read as spot is not a dog 
or a spot is brown. But these two have very different meanings. This one's saying that it's either this one or this one. And it doesn't tell you which one specifically. Either this is true, that he's not a dog, or this is true, that spot is brown. But this one's saying and implies that neither is true. He's not a dog, and he's not brown. So this one's making an even stronger claim. He's not either of these. Whereas this one's saying, he might not be this, or he could be this. So they're very different meanings. So disjunction negation does not imply this one. It's rather implying this one. That's what the conclusion is saying. And in technical terms, we say that this is a negation with an embedded disjunction. It's a negation, and inside the negation is a disjunction. Whereas this one is a disjunction with an embedded negation. It's a disjunction, and inside one of the disjuncts is a negation. And the next rule is disjunction introduction. P. Therefore, P or Q. So for example, Premise one, spot is a dog. Conclusion, therefore, spot is a dog or spot is brown. It's just saying one of those is true. So in summary, we've seen these rules. First, we saw modus ponens and modus tollens. Then after that, we went to these three logical forms, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive syllogism, and dilemma. And most recently, we've looked at this, these ones. Conjunction negation, which says not P, therefore, it's not the case that P and that Q. Conjunction introduction, P, Q, therefore, P and Q. Disjunction negation, not P, not Q, therefore, it's not the case that either P or Q. And disjunction introduction, P, therefore, P or Q. We can also combine these rules to make more complex arguments. I'll give you one example here. Premise 1, spot is not a dog. Premise 2, spot is not a cat. Therefore, it's not the case that either spot is a dog or spot is a cat. So here is a sub-conclusion, and we're going to give a main conclusion later. So in this sub-conclusion, we have this claim from 1 and 2 by disjunction negation. So here we're saying where this subconclusion came from. Last exercise, you had to form arguments with subconclusions, but many of you forgot to write where it came from, and so you lost marks. So remember, you need to write where your subconclusion comes from. But in addition to that, you also need to write what rule you are using to arrive at that conclusion. So here I'm using the rule disjunction negation. Now let's look at the rest of the argument. Premise 4, if spot is an animal, then either spot is a dog or spot is a cat. Conclusion, therefore it's not the case that spot is an animal. And here again I have an explanation of where this conclusion comes from. I say it comes from 3 and 4, it's coming from these two, by modus tollens. So I've used 3 and 4, and the rule modus tollens to get to the conclusion. It's not the case that spot is an animal because three is denying the consequence of this premise. And so we need to deny the antecedent as well, which is this conclusion. So it's time for another exercise. For each set of premises, Figure out whether you can use them together to validly infer a conclusion. So for example, take this set of premises. This has three different premises. Liz is not tall. Liz does not like basketball. If Liz is tall or Liz likes basketball, then she can join the basketball team. So for this set of premises, figure out whether you can use them together, all of them together, to validly infer a conclusion. If so, put the argument in formal premise conclusion form with subconclusions. And for each conclusion, both subconclusions and main conclusions, make sure that you indicate which lines it is taken from and which inference rule is used. Okay? So you need to use all of these premises. 
If you can use all these premises to get to a conclusion, then put that argument in a formal premise conclusion form, the subconclusion. And then do the same with this set of premises, this set of premises, and this set of premises. If you cannot validly infer a conclusion, then state that you cannot do so. And here again, I have the set of rules that you can use for your reference. Now we will look at predicates and quantifiers. Begin by looking at this argument. All dogs are animals. Spot is a dog. Therefore, Spot is an animal. Is this argument's logical form valid according to the rules that we've been looking at? If we tried to formulate it in terms of propositional variables, what we would get is something like this. All dogs are animals would be formulated as P. Spot is a dog would be formulated as Q. And spot is an animal would be formulated as therefore R. But clearly this is not a valid argument form. If you put one sentence here and one sentence here, and those are true, it doesn't imply that the, some other sentence is true. You can't just put in whatever sentences you want in these three, and you'll come out with a true conclusion if the premises are true. This is not a valid argument form. But this argument itself does seem to have a valid argument form in it. We just have not yet captured it. So in this case, propositional variables do not get us a logically valid inference form from this argument. If we want to formulate this argument in a valid logical form, we need to use predicates and quantifiers. So we would formulate the first premise as this. For all x, if x is a dog, then x is an animal then you could have premise 2 and the conclusion be the same. In this premise, what we have is a quantifier. This is called a quantifier. It tells you which things it's talking about. And then we have predicates. Dog, animal, dog, animal, these are predicates. We have these x's, which are variables. And we have spot here, which is an element or you might just say an object. So let's look closer at these sort of quantifier sentences. So take these examples. There is a brown dog and all dogs are animals. There is a brown dog would be formulated like this. There is an X such that X is a dog and X is brown. Here the E, this is a backwards E, and this is called a existential quantifier, meaning it quantifies over something that exists. Or it's saying that there is something. There is something in existence. And one of those things in existence is a dog and is brown. This one, on the other hand, is formulated like this. And it has this thing called a universal quantifier. It's an upside down A, A upside down. This is quantifying over all things. It's referring to everything. It's saying everything is such that if it's a dog, then it's an animal. So where this is saying there's one specific thing that is a dog and is brown, this thing is pointing to everything. Everything in the universe. It points to this thing, that thing, that thing, that thing, that, everything in the universe. It says this thing, if it's a dog, then it's an animal. If I'm a dog, then I'm an animal. If you're a dog, you're an animal. If that chair is a dog, then that chair is an animal. If the universe is a dog, then that universe is an animal. If spot is a dog, then spot is an animal, etc., etc., etc. It points to every single thing in the universe and says that of that thing, if it's a dog, then it's an animal. Whereas this one's just saying that of all the things that are in the universe, at least one of them is both a dog and is brown. Notice that this sentence is not formulated like this. This says for all x, x is a dog, and x is an animal. This is not how you formulate it. It is too strong. You see it has the phrase, it uses the term and here. 
whereas this sentence uses the terms if then. This is too strong because it's saying everything is both a dog and an animal. And that's too strong. It's saying that the chair is a dog and an animal. It's saying you are a dog and an animal. It's saying the sky is a dog and an animal. And that's too strong. It, and it's quite obviously false for most things. Whereas this is much weaker. It's saying if the chair is a dog, then it's animal. Well, that's true. If my chair is a dog, then it's animal. But this would be false. My chair is a dog and it is an animal. That would be false. So universals like this with universal quantifiers usually have the form if then. Whereas existentials like this with the existential quantifier are usually formulated with an and if it has two predicates in it like dog and brown. And we have some general rules, some general inference rules that we can apply to existentials and universals. So here's two I'll show you. Existential generalization says that C is F. And this C is just, you put an element, you put an object in here. So for example, Spot is F, or, or Socrates is F, or Donald Trump is F. Right? C is F. Therefore, there is an X such that X is F. So for example, Spot is a dog and is brown. Therefore, there is an X such that X is a dog and X is brown. So this is called existential generalization because it has an existential in the conclusion and it's a generalization. It's not saying specifically that C is F or that specifically that Spot is F. They're just saying that there is something that is F. There is something that is a dog and a brown. There is something that is a dog and is brown. It's not saying specifically that Spot is brown. It's just saying generally something is a dog and is brown. Universal instantiation is the next rule. It says for all x, x is f. Therefore, c is f for some element or object here. So for example, premise one, for all x, if x is a dog, then x is an animal. Therefore, if spot is a dog, then spot is an animal. So what this is telling us is that, well, the all x means we can just put any sort of object here we want. So here we'll put spot. And since this x is referring to this x and this x, we can put spot here and we put spot here. We cannot put spot here and some other object here like Donald Trump. We can't say if spot is a dog, then Donald Trump is an animal. No, since both of these x's are in these brackets, these brackets mean that spot has to be put in both of these things. So we'll put spot. If spot is a dog, then spot is an animal. You can conclude anything from this. You could say, if Donald Trump is a dog, then Donald Trump is an animal. If you are a dog, then you are an animal. This all x just tells you you can put any object you want in here. So those are two rules concerning these quantifiers. So turn back to the argument that we looked at the beginning. All dogs are animals. Spot is a dog. Therefore, spot is an animal. We saw that using propositional variables didn't give us a logical form that was valid. But we can now put it in terms of the universal quantifier to make a valid argument. So we put premise one, all dogs are animals, as for all x, if x is a dog, then x is an animal. Then we can get to the conclusion, therefore, if spot is a dog, then spot is an animal. How do we get to this conclusion? Well, we used premise one, and we used universal instantiation. Universal instantiation and premise one together got us that if spot is a dog, then spot is an animal. Now we can go to premise 3. We'll take this premise, spot is a dog, and put it as premise 3. And then we can get to our main conclusion, therefore spot is an animal. And how did we get to this main conclusion? From premises 2 and 3 by modus ponens. Right? So we use modus ponens. We said spot is a dog. So if spot is a dog, then spot is an animal. So therefore spot is an animal. And so this argument has a logical argument form after all 
that allows us to use these logical inference rules to get to a conclusion. So this shows us that this is a valid argument form. We know that from premises 1 to 3, we can get to the conclusion just by using universal instantiation and modus ponens. So let's do an exercise. First, for each proposition, use the variable x and one of the quantifier symbols, upside down a or backwards e, to symbolize the proposition. So the first proposition will symbolize this one, all knowledge is true. And the second one is, there are selfless actions. By the way, it can be difficult to use these letters because your computer might not be able to use them or see them. So if you have that problem, you can just use the normal letter A. So instead of upside down AX, you can put normal AX. If you don't want to use backwards E, or your computer has trouble using it, then just normal E. So use normal E, X, instead of backwards E, X, and use normal A, X, instead of upside down A, X. Okay? And then the next part is question two. So I'll give you a set of premises. For each set of premises, figure out whether you can use them together to validly infer a conclusion. If so, put the argument in formal premise conclusion form with subconclusions. So this is the same sort of exercise that you were doing before. So figure out if you can use both of these together to validly infer a conclusion. If you cannot, then say that you cannot. If you can, then put the argument in formal premise conclusion form and use a subconclusion. So do that for this and do that for this set of premises too.